Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 2 of You Have the Right to Remain Fat by Virgie Tovar. So you'll notice that I am have footage um, over my audio instead of showing you guys the book. The reason for this is copyright issues. Like, I think I can get away with showing the introduction in the first chapter without it being a big issue. But from here on out, because... While my audio is transformative because I'm inserting my commentary into this and I am reading this out loud which makes it a performance and stuff, the visuals are not transformative in nature and therefore could be more subject to copyright violation. So from here on out just consider this kind of a podcast of her book with my commentary and then something like just me doing crafts or something. I'm not entirely sure what I'm putting up for the video yet but something else will be put up for the video. Uh, restriction doesn't work. It's not you. For nearly 20 years, I was on a diet. For 20 years, I was on a diet. I was restricting what I ate and trying to manipulate my body shape and size through exercise. Every single bite of food felt like a grand drama being played out on this stage of my life. Every day began with a sense of disappointment. I felt like I had failed myself, Richard Simmons, and the whole wide world. I read articles about easy diet tips in my grandma's copies of Woman's World. I listened to interviews with fitness gurus. I ate grapefruit. So much grapefruit. I watched Susan Powder's Stop the Insanity with the same religiosity that many people watch televangelists. Dieting was my religion and my salvation was always just around the corner. My weight frequently fluctuated, but not by much. No matter what happened, though, I never blamed diets. I never blamed Susan Powder. I never blamed Women's World. I never blamed Grapefruit. I blamed myself. It never occurred to me that the diet industry was lying to me and everyone else. That it was relying on the knowledge that women blame ourselves for how we are treated. The diet industry was using language like easy and simple to manipulate dieters everywhere into believing that if their programs didn't work, it was because we were using them incorrectly. Here's a fact. Despite all of the promises of the diet industry, paradoxically, dieting leads to weight gain over time. Let me say that again. Over time, dieting leads to weight gain. I say there's nothing wrong with weight gain, but the culture says differently. So if the stated goal of thinness is not actually being achieved, then what are we really doing when we are dieting? So again, with that, um, dieting leads to weight gain over time, that's due to lack of compliance with whatever diet. And honestly, I'm not a fan of dieting as much as lifestyle change. I think dieting going intense really quickly is just doomed to fail. I, th I think small incremental changes is better, but that's me. Dieting doesn't do the thing it's allegedly designed to do, but dieting does lead to a number of other results. Low self-esteem and decreased self-advocacy during sexual negotiation. There is some evidence that suggests that fat women negotiate for condoms less frequently than their thin counterparts. Fat people experience more anxiety in our daily lives. So the thing about fat people experiencing more anxiety in their daily lives, I'm just kind of curious what that means. Because my first thought is, well, I've seen a lot of fat people anxious about whether they're going to fit in chairs, whether they're going to be able to have a seat if they need to for, like, if they're wandering around the mall or something. Uh, if people are going to make fun of them. And I think if... I think that people are making fun of them is a legitimate, like, issue since it's so far out of your control. But if you're worried that you're going to break furniture or not be able to sit down when you really need to, then perhaps the key would be to improve your stamina and maybe lose a little bit of weight so that's less of a concern. But I could be wrong and the anxiety could be from something else. Uh, please tell me what you think it might be in the comments down below. We experience the effects of something called minority stress. We experience something called minority stress, the negative physiological outcomes of discrimination, cruelty, and social ostracization over a lifetime. That is some fucking bullshit. Like, you want to talk about minority stress in terms of LGBTQ, in terms of race, and uh, for those that have very specific wear for their religion, it, I can also see it minority stress being a thing for people from certain religious groups. For fat people, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing! It's not the same thing and you're not a minority. The majority of the U.S. is overweight. 
The stress can result in suppressed immunity, shortened lifespan, and decreased heart health. Not coincidentally, some of the very things often attributed to high body weight in the medical industry. Are you fucking kidding me? So it's not, it's not that you're so overweight that your body can't function properly. It's not that you're so overweight that you are putting additional stress on your organs, especially your heart. It's not any of that. It's the minority stress. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Further, if we all miraculously became our doctor recommended BMI overnight, we would awake the following day to find that the goalpost had been moved because control is the ultimate purpose of diet culture and fat phobia. Actually, I don't think that you're, I mean, you talk about goalpost moving. So here's the thing, getting down to a low enough BMI is great. That's definitely a step in the right direction, but I don't know if it's exactly goalpost moving to say, okay, now make sure you get so much exercise every week. That in itself lends to the fact that it's not just about being thinner. Being thinner makes an impact, but healthy habits also play a big role. I, I'm curious what they mean about this, go, what, what Virgie means about this goalpost moving. Because is she saying that, like, once you get down to the healthy BMI, then it's about being even thinner so you're attractive? Like, what does she mean by that? What is the alternative? To stop? Stop being terrified of fatness? Stop marginalizing fat people? To recognize that nobody is superior or inferior to another? My core belief is both painfully obvious and wholly subversive. Every person, regardless of weight or health status, deserves to live a life completely free from bigotry and discrimination. I agree, but here's the thing with the fat acceptance movement is that they define bigotry and discrimination as things that aren't bigotry or discrimination. They've I've seen fat acceptance creators they essentially charge people with thought crimes that like I can tell like uh, fat fat feminists felt like it was a form of discrimination or bigotry or something like that that she was walking around Universal Studios in a bralette and people and she's bigger and people were staring at her like she felt like that was a form of fat oppression when even in that video there weren't really anyone any people staring at her and even if they were she was in a kind of a family friendly place with a more revealing top and i'm not saying that she can't do that but it does draw more attention is that biggest treat discrimination fat phobia whatever you want to call it or are there underlying variables that it's, it's not, and even if, let's say everyone was looking, let's say everyone was looking at her because she was fat, but no one approached her, no one commented on anything. Is that really any form of discrimination? I'm just, I'm just wondering. That might sound really simple, but imagine for one second what this really means. That you would have full access to all things that matter most to you, no matter how big or small you are. Whether you were able to run a mile in eight minutes or you hadn't run a day in your life. No caveats, no fine print. Just you in your life without any barriers you perceive to be in your way due to weight or body shape. Okay, but that's unrealistic for literally anybody. There, without any barriers. Without any barriers at all. Like, graph that onto almost anything else and it would be unrealistic like there's sh you should not have any barriers regarding your height well that would mean that those top shelves of grocery stores would be discriminatory against short people that would also mean myself as an adult let's say i want to crawl through one of those stupid um like mcdonald's tubes i remember playing those a lot as a kid let's say as an adult i want to relive that and let's just pretend that it's empty and there's no kids. I still would not be able to fit in those tubes anymore because I am an adult and entirely too big to to f fit in those spaces. Does that mean that McDonald's is discriminating against me for being taller and bigger than a child? Like, I, I understand that that's a bit of an extreme example, but I think the point still stands and I think the grocery store one was a pretty good analogy for sometimes there's just barriers based on the way things are set up and while ideally I think even for someone like myself I was trying to reach like the back of the top shelf to uh not today but yesterday and it was really hard and I would love for there to just be like a step stool 
in those aisles to be able to get up and have easier reach. But chances are they would probably be stolen. Uh, there's also, um, because some people are very unsteady on their feet, there's also a liability risk. That's why they don't put those stools in place. And so sometimes you do have to get an employee to help or sometimes you have to get someone who's taller than you to help. It sucks, but that would be, just from what I'm seeing here, no barriers based on your weight or body shape. Body shape includes how tall you are. The top shelf of grocery stores would then be discrimination for short people, wouldn't it? It's not realistic. And let's say another barrier would be like the weight limit that they have on carnival rides. Like those weight limits are there for safety. A lot of those carnival rides are very old and meant for generations that were smaller, quite frankly. Doesn't mean that it's it's discrimination because you can't fit in it. It's just the reality of the situation. There's a bunch of inconvenient truths and inconvenient realities that we experience on a daily basis. Some of them are legitimate discrimination and some of them are legitimate bigotry, but that doesn't mean every inconvenience that is experienced by anyone is a form of discrimination based on some unique quality to themselves. So, sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, and I think I, there were a couple of extreme examples in there, but I stand by my general point. This means that you wouldn't feel the need to change your body size in order to be taken seriously as a romantic partner. If you want to go that route, then the same thing would need to be applied to height, to whether someone's bald or not, to um, what have you. There's always going to be people with preferences that would be like, no, I don't want to date this type of person. I don't want to date a bald person. I don't want to date a short person. I don't want to date a tall person. I don't want to date a muscular person. I don't want to date a skinny person. Like the, there's, there's just general preferences. It's not a matter of being taken seriously as a romantic partner. Although I think that there are some that fetishize fat women. Uh, there's also those that just, it's not their preference. It's not a matter of taking you seriously or not. It's a matter of preference. You wouldn't internalize your body's limits as a personal failure because you would have no framework for your body as a source of failure. That means that you would not be socially punished if you gained 40 pounds and you would not be socially rewarded if you lost 40 pounds. I believe there would likely be significantly less weight fluctuation without diet culture and fat phobia. I, here's the thing, I don't think that there's a huge, I mean, yeah, you get a little bit of social reward for losing weight. Oh, look, you look so much thinner. That's great. I don't think that's there's anything wrong with that because, and in general, I, so over the pandemic, I gained 20 pounds. That's why I got all the way up to 96. I've lost 10 of those pounds so far. I'm trying to get down to the other 10 to be back to where I started pre-pandemic and then continue my weight loss from there. But I gained those 20 pounds no one commented on it or anything. I received no social backlash for it. I think that saying that there's social punishment for gaining weight isn't entirely true. I think you're more likely to receive, like, social punishment, meaning negative comments or something, if you're, like, Amberlynn Reed, where you say you're on a weight loss journey and then you do a bunch of things that don't contribute to that weight loss journey and then you play victim. Like, that's more likely to get a social punishment than anything else. This means that when you went to the doctor, you wouldn't be treated differently or be refused proper treatment if you were fat, but sometimes the proper treatment is to lose weight. Like, I'm not saying that there are doctors that overlook shit. There are. But, especially for, like, joint issues and stuff, the best treatment is to lose a bit of weight. That's what happened with my back. Sometimes you just need to lose a bit of weight because your muscles can't handle it. Your muscles or your joints can't handle it. This means that food would be stripped of moral meaning, which would make eating less terrifying. You wouldn't feel morally inferior if you ate tacos rather than a salad, since food shame wouldn't be a thing. I, I struggle with the whole morally, food morality bullshit that they keep pushing. Like, I just, I don't, I don't get it so much, but I don't, I eat what I want to eat and take in the consideration of the consequences of my choices while I'm doing it. So perhaps that's the difference. I think guilt tends to come more from when we make an impulsive decision uh, rather than when we simply make a bad choice. I think 
impulsivity tends to be a greater conduit for guilt than bad choices. Like, even when it comes to food. Like, you have cake. You were, let's say you were planning on eating that cake. You were, like, went without sweets all week and this was the piece of cake you were going to have this week and you were just going to enjoy it. It was 500 calories, but you had budgeted for that. So you ate that piece of cake. Was the cake less nutritionally valuable? Yes. Do you feel bad about it? No, because you had planned on it. As to where, let's say, you're out with friends and people and you impulsively eat like three pieces of cake. It's still 500 calories, but you didn't budget it for anything. Like you didn't budget for it at all. And so now you've kind of gone off your plan because of an impulsive decision. Same thing can be applied to money. Same thing can be applied to a lot of things. Impulsivity tends to lead more to guilt than bad decisions, in my opinion. Now, there are exceptions for this, but in in my experience, impulsivity leads to guilt far more than the decisions themselves. This means that when you had important moments in your life, you wouldn't be expected to lose a bunch of weight. You could focus on the joy of those important moments rather than being distracted by anxiety. This means that the idea of sweating all over your clothes in a public space filled with fitness machinery solely to lose weight would not make you feel like you were becoming a better person. It's not so much about better, it's about healthier. Like, you're doing something. I, like, I think there's this overemphasis on you think you are morally superior, when in reality that feeling of like being a better person, it's the act of working towards a long-term goal. That is very satisfying. Now, especially so when it's something that you're not used to. A lot of people aren't physically physical activity oriented. And so the process of putting the effort to become physically activity oriented and putting this effort in for a long-term goal like weight loss does make them feel good. But that doesn't, it's not necessarily a morality base. You know what I mean? This means that the gym industry's current business model, which actually relies upon members signing up in January and not ever using the gym really wouldn't work. You wouldn't feel compelled to talk about how potato chips are evil your coworkers wouldn't haggle over the tiniest sliver of cake. You know that one person who says a little smaller on repeat. There's the reference to the fucking cake again. There's the reference to the cake again. She's obsessed with this fucking cake. And I've never talked about potato chips being evil. And I think that you greatly overestimate human's ability to immediately commit to something new right off the bat. That whole thing about signing up in January and not ever using it. I've signed up for internet subscriptions to learn things and not use them. That's part of human nature where you are, are wanting to take that step forward and so you go through the easy process first of paying for something. You don't actually follow through with it. It's a process of learning how to learn. It's a process of learning how to make lifestyle changes. It's a process of learning how to form new habits it's not it's not just like the nefarious gym people counting on people signing up and never actually using it although i'm sure that's part of it that's also just part of human human nature to sign up for something and not follow through with it you wouldn't break out in a cold sweat every time you walked past ice cream at the grocery store and we wouldn't be handing over 60 billion dollars a year to the diet industry how much do we hand over to the fast food industry is my question virgie this means that when you thought of how you would look in the future, you would be the same size in your fantasies as you are right now. I disagree. I disagree with that. I think we all, when we're thinking about our future selves, we are thinking about an idealized self. And so however that is for you is how you're going to view yourself. There are some people that don't just want to be thin, they want to be muscular. There's some people that want to be curvy. There's some people that want to be slim thick. Like the dissatisfaction with who we are in, in some aspect, whether that be physically, personality-wise, emotionally, mentally, whatever you want to call it, that's part of human nature is to be dissatisfied with yourself. That is how we grow. I think that being the same size in your fantasies as you are right now is not part of, like, I, th I think visualizing yourself physically different is not part of diet culture or fat phobia or whatever the fuck you want to call it. I think that's simply part of human nature. It may not be about size. It may be about how your hair looks. It may be about how you dress. It could be a, a myriad of things. It 
some people choose weight. Some For some people, it's weight. For a lot of people, it's weight because, especially in the U.S., because we are severely overweight and obese. This means that you would stop actively trying to control your weight and just focus on other stuff like your life, what and who makes you happy, and the pursuits that matter to you. Maybe weight loss matters to me. Why, why take away the autonomy that we have of saying that I want to lose weight for XYZ reason? No, that's just diet culture. That's just fat phobia. No, sometimes it's about, like I think I mentioned this before, it's like the lowest form of body modification. Maybe I just want to be able to feel like I can control how I look. Maybe I just want to do that. Maybe I just really want this one physique. And for some people, that might be being really fat, and so they eat a lot instead. Like, there's some people that just have this vision of what they want to be in their heads, and so they will pursue that goal. Not necessarily fat phobia. It's not necessarily diet culture industry. Maybe it's just what they want. You can begin to see the ways fat phobia manifests in not just the obvious avoidance of weight gain, but also in the way we imagine important moments of our future selves. It's kind of scary to think of all that because then you have to admit just how pervasive size-based bigotry and fat phobia really are. And that's the end of the chapter. I think that's, I don't think it's nearly as prevalent as they like to say it is. I don't think that size-based bigotry and fat phobia because you are worried about whether you can fit into chairs or not is not... It, it's not like the diet culture industry. It's not size-based bigotry. It, it's not. But I'm going to leave that there. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And I will see you guys next time.